thanks for coming. But, um, my name is Q Beck. This is Cody Bell and Matt Sullivan. And uh, we're the three co-founders of Amiga, and which is a mobile platform for gaming for families. And so um, you know, we want to keep this really casual. So please feel free to interrupt and have questions. And um, you know, also, if you see any just glaring errors, please point them out. Um, you know, so fighting this kind of two-front war is a pretty challenging thing, and uh, we're really learning as we go. And uh, you know, we've made some mistakes around the way, along the way, and uh, but we think to keep getting better. And again, if you don't know, lean startup stuff, um, just a rapid iteration, not just you know from a software standpoint, but also your business standpoint. In lean, you don't have mistakes; you have learning opportunities. There's something like IDEO has something like if you do it like if you make a if you do it once it's an error or something but if you do it a second time then it becomes a mistake and so we kind of you know hope for learning and not you know because they become mistakes if you keep if you do it a second time you're tolerant. stupid yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you just didn't hear it very well the first time and, um, because sometimes they sound different the second time you know. but um, so. Um, jump right into it. Um, so we have two customers. On the one side, it's developers with a pretty unique um, set of problems. And one is what Apple actually uses for their customer-facing um, advertisements. And that is just there are a lot of developers out there building for uh, mobile devices, not just Apple, but other mobile devices. And um, there's a lot of noise in that space. And people have been sold on the idea to learn this technology and build for it, but then they're having a really hard time connecting with an audience. And then on the other hand, we've got families, which uh, this technology, all these gadgets that you carry all the time, is really kind of um, separating these people. They're all hooked up to the network, but not really connected to one another. And uh, if you've ever seen me speak before, we've actually, we had a similar image to this, which we've replaced. We took this from an ad that, uh, the Windows 7, you know, ad yeah. that just came out this week. There are like three or four images exactly like this throughout the presentation. So we were wondering if we should write them a check for doing all our marketing for us. <laughs> <laughs> but we no longer have to pay models. Uh, <laughs> They're so expensive. Yeah. I think the value proposition was they're going to get families and people to stop looking at the phone, though. Yeah. Isn't that it? Right. So that's why that doesn't work. By selling phones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So we're actually working on the problem that they identified. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it's kind of like, I like that. Yeah. More, you know, what's the solution? You know, more phones. Clear. <laughs> yeah. By the way, we're announcing a partnership with Microsoft. <laughs> and so, you know, now that you know these are our two problems, um, you know, what are the assumptions that we kind of had to make? And so, how we're looking at this is, if you've read Stephen Blank, or if you're not familiar with him, the Four Steps of the Epiphany, um, he, he breaks down customer de development into kind of four distinct categories. And we're going to really focus on customer discovery. And so, how when you're fighting this uh, two-front war. How you can really um, look at both and have both inform your product, sometimes simultaneously, sometimes <coughs> you alternate between the two. And so we first had to start with a couple assumptions, and one was that families want to play together. The second is that developers want to reach an audience, and in particular, this family audience, because it is just huge. And then also that the existing um, solutions out there aren't really working for either of these people and that there's a product that will sit between them. Sometimes when you, you know, if you can wage this war right, you can come to that right, um, that product where you sit between these two customers is just sublime for it solves both of their issues. And so, um, this is kind of where we see the media in our business sitting. You know, on the one side, you've got developers, and on the other side, you've got families. Um, the families are really starved for um, content, and then on this side, the developers are really starving for that audience. And so developers provide all the games, and then the families are ultimately their consumers, but they have no idea how to find them. And so that's just the high-level intro, and I'll give you that. Thank 
you have a question. Do you guys yeah. charge on both sides? Or? Uh, well, currently, the way we charge, so a couple of the apps that we have on our platform now are ours, and so we do direct sales for those. And then we also charge a revenue share with developers um, right now, which is just based on the users that use the functionality that Amigo has, which we can all we can see all that on our back end. But you don't charge for the SDK itself? No, okay. that's free. And then you get an API key from us. And uh, the reason we don't charge for the SDK is because that wouldn't work very well. Uh, the problem that Q was talking about a second ago, where he was showing the Apple app, and it said 200,000 apps in the App Store, uh, that's kind of the app developer's nightmare. You spend you know hundreds of hours working on this app, and then you put it in the App Store, and then maybe you sell 100 copies at 99 cents each. We've talked to a lot of developers like that who have great games, but you know they've, they've lost hundreds or maybe thousands of dollars throughout this process. So they're a little gun shy when it comes to, uh, hey, we promise we're going to sell some games this time. Uh, they, they wouldn't opt for that approach. But if we can't actually deliver users, then they've shown that they're willing to pay for that. So we're going to do tag team with this. Um, Q did again. the intro. Back again. Check it selected. Uh, okay, so Q kind of talked about our uh, the pipeline and kind of the business as uh, as how we've seen it. Um, so we think, well, so this is the uh, the product that, that we have, and it, it kind of well, wake up. Man. Um, this slide addresses both the both the consumer or both the developers and the uh, and the families. And so for developers, you know, you use Famigo, the Famigo platform, to get your game uh, there. And what there gives you is accounts. Uh, we offer any account structure. We're not going to try and pitch you or anything like that. But we offer these features, which um, we think families identify with, um, we think families will use, and uh, create family interaction. Um, just so you know. <coughs> so as Q kind of said, um, right now we're not focusing on many or much of our hours on, on marketing to families. Um, we're choosing developers. <coughs> Kind of what Ash said is, you know, he implied that there's a chicken versus the egg problem, and we didn't see that in our market. And I think for most platforms, it's probably not a chicken versus the egg problem because, um, as the last line says, an empty platform is useless. If you build a, you know, a framework, but for, for us, if we built a framework but we didn't have any games to offer consumers, we wouldn't be able to sell the platform. Um, so games bring families. So that's why we started off. Uh, building games so that we can build the platform. And now we're selling that platform to developers so that we can build up that library of games. And then once we get enough you know, critical mass over there, we'll start marketing heavily to families. And uh, one other way that we got around this chicken and egg problem is that we were our own uh, first customers on the platform side in terms of developers. <coughs> we built the, uh, the first three games on our platform. And um, you know, so that allowed us to validate this idea here that games bring families. If you look at our games, they're not like the greatest games in the world, probably. You know, I don't think uh, anyone's worried that we're going to be um, unseating uh, World of Warcraft or anything anytime soon. But you know, we get you know hundreds of people. Hot potato is pretty good. Well, you're right, it is. So we're trying to do a massively multiplayer potato warfare game. No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> uh, but what we've been able to find is that you know we have these three games out there. We built this platform, and we find that. Um, these games, with you know very minimal marketing efforts, do succeed in bringing families in. They just find these multiplayer games because the market is so huge for families. Right. Uh, how's that bottom point any <coughs> as far as not having games versus not having users? Well, you can yeah, I, I see your point, but uh, think about it this way: if you think about it in terms of like marginal um, improvements, if you have one developer on a platform, that's really useful. Uh -huh. If you have one user on a platform, it's not very useful because they don't have anything to do. So, you know, for us, it's kind of like a, it, there's a definite precedence here. It seems like also it's a little different from kind of a marketplace problem because for you guys, the developer's not losing anything by using your, your platform. He gets extra features. Well, he loses a little bit in the terms of uh, like hours spent working yeah. on this because it may be like a day or two to integrate with us. Yeah. Um, so, and he's giving up some revenue else. share, right? What's that? And he's giving right. up some revenue share. Right, but you know, revenue share is kind of uh, dependent on him actually earning revenue. So but at the end of the day, he's not launching to this empty marketplace. He's still That's launching to the app store. Right. Like he would be otherwise. 
So right. Yeah, so. Right. That, yeah, that, that's In, in the end, you're right. I mean, this is not a U-ship business model. It's not a marketplace. We're not trying to match a single developer with a single user. Um, so, um, yeah, and I guess to, I had a point, but to reiterate what he said, um, actually, I think that's in the next slide. Okay. Um, let's see. Actually, I want to go to this next slide. So, he was saying that. Um, uh, so, I began that last slide by saying that right now we're focusing on developers. And so, this is what this slide shows: is that um, you've got a number, of, or you have our effort on the uh, the y-axis and a number of developers side on the x-axis. So, right now we're up here. We are heavily recruiting developers, and we're not spending much time. Uh, on recruiting consumers. As we start to develop, or as we start to sign on more developers, we plan to ramp up our consumer marketing and ramp down our developer marketing. Um, but also, as Cody mentioned, which I think is, is really, really important, we're not completely ignoring consumers. Um, we have uh, organic, you know, you know, we're acquiring them organically, and we're monitoring, we're measuring everything that they do. Uh, so that when we do decide to get over here and really flip the switch and scale on consumers, we know what channels to hit. We know where our effective marketing, uh, you know, where we're going to get eyeballs and where we're going to drive, uh, you know, drive our message home. Um, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. And you might be presenting this later, but what tactics are, tactics are you using for marketing specifically to different <coughs> groups? Like, how are you marketing to developers, and how are you marketing to families, and how do you think that will change over time? Right. Um, right now. Uh, Developers mostly. It's uh, we've got three strategies. We've got a couple of you know organic ads going out. Uh, we've optimized you know our, our developer page and our a developer blog, so we're getting some organic, you know, uh, but not much. Our most effective is actually just you know it's not cold. I mean it's cold emailing people. So we go out and we stalk you know developers with games. It's called sales. Stalk. Yeah, stalk. stalk's a bad word. It's what? It's called stalk. Yeah, what did you say? It's called sales. Sales? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's called sales. It's called sales. No, it is. It is. And we talked about that earlier. I mean, um, one of the things that we really had to iterate on was uh, our sales message. And, you know, you don't, uh, uh, that's a whole other topic, I guess. But, um, so we go out and we approach developers who, you know, we see, you know, they've got great games, um, but we know that they're kind of lost in the marketplace. And everybody that we approach so far has been, yeah, you know, we're totally lost in the marketplace. And it's unfortunate because half of them have lost everything, and they can't even afford, you know, the two hundred fifty dollars to, uh, or you know, the one day to go and integrate with us because they just don't have the time or money, or they're that depressed about the fact that their app has done that poorly. But the other half is actually pretty happy, um, and you know, we really help them integrate, and you know, we really talk to them, and they, they seem to think that this is this is something that is, uh, uh, you know, could really help their sales. Yeah, one of the great things about trying to market to uh, this particular developer market is that we know where all of them are already. Uh, they're in the App Store. And in addition to that, we know basically how well they're doing based upon like the reviews they've received so far. Um, and you know, you can kind of uh, can tell whether they've ever made the top 20. And uh, you know, it's very easy to backtrack from that information to actual contact information. And um, you know, at that point, we find that these people are actually pretty willing to talk to us, and we've proven that we can, you know, drive the revenue for them a little bit. But how how have you proven that you have them? Well, because we have the, we have enough data from the three games that we built <coughs> ourselves that that uh, data is st uh, statistically significant, showing uh, in terms of like, here's how many families create a new account based on this one game. Here's how many people these families share their game with, and we know that each time they share one of these games, someone is buying another copy. But so, so are you selling here in the sense that you're saying it's a, there's a very likelihood that this will happen, but we do not currently have these users? Is that what it is? No. Uh, we, we say, look at this data point here. This is a game that was launched on the platform. It resulted in, you know, like 1,500 game invites, which resulted in, you know, 700 game sales. That's actual data that we have from actual games that we've already launched. So, so the message to developers is, yes, we're, we're a new company. We have a very small number of users. Um, but that's on purpose because we've been tracking what they do, and so you know, sign up with us now. When we you know flip the marketing switch, you'll be able to come on with us. Yeah, I didn't mean it to be a pejorative, but it does oh, mean right. a distinction versus saying we have them versus selling their different tactics. I just wanted to understand. But I think the thing you might be mistaking is that they're not inviting their users to the game. The people invite anybody 
they, they're just giving them a, they're, they're enabling them to make it really easy to invite people. Okay, totally organic. So the people that get invited aren't already playing Famigo. They're just they're other people in my family, and I'm just inviting them to play the game I'm playing, not this, not to join the Famigo network. Got it. In terms of the way the marketing works on the family side, it's not really Famigo marketing to families so much as families marketing to other families and people within those families. Yeah. Um, from a credibility perspective, that helps us a lot because you know not many people know who Famigo is or, or why we matter. But it matters a lot more if uh, you know your brother says, "Hey, I found this great game and we can play together as a family." That's a lot more likely to uh, result in a sale. Yeah. But I'm sorry to, to answer the other half of your question, <coughs> consumer side. <laughs> uh, we are fleshing that out as we speak, um, trying to figure out how to approach consumers. We know consumers base, or families buy, you know, uh, actually Q should probably speak to this, but we know families families buy based on recommendation, and they get those recommendations from people they trust. They've started to trust bloggers, so that's one, one place. They definitely trust other people in their neighborhood, you know, family, friends. Um, and then parents obviously trust kids. So uh, what, you know, <coughs> Q has, you know, kind of been uh, <laughs> beating into my head recently. Is that there's a reason that sugary cereals are down near kids' eyeballs, right? And the Wheaties are up near, you know, adults' eyeballs. And so kids are the driver of the, a lot of these purchases, and not just purchases. Kids are the driver of fun purchases, right? So um, that's that's the third set of eyeballs that, that we're approaching. <coughs> And we're just, as I said, we're fleshing that out right now with our three demo teams. One more question. Yeah, so, yeah, you had a question. I was wondering what you did in the developer space in terms of trying to have such a high, high number there. Have you uh, tried different experiments or right? Like, a I mean, te A/B testing in terms of how you do that. <coughs> A/B testing. Oh, to so determine which approach is better. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't done any actual, you know, formal A/B testing for that. It's all. I'm not sitting there with a spreadsheet and crunching numbers for statistically relevant, you know, A/B tests. But yeah, I mean, we're testing uh, AdWords versus organic, you know, versus blogging versus Twitter outreach versus emails, and you know, we're just ju using a judgment call to determine which one works best. Um, <coughs> yeah, we don't have very pretty much. much a binary thing. Like, what works best is us reaching out. <laughs> yeah, we don't have too much data there because this is a pretty limited market. And uh, if we were to go out and try and uh, canvas like a thousand app users and get some really interesting data from which approach works best, we'd probably burn so many bridges with the app developer market that they may not ever want to talk to us again. And one thing, we'll get in that in, in a minute, but um, we can reiterate it. One problem with you know, the developer market is that um, there are other people that are trying to provide these solutions, and so they are getting burned. You know, they're just, they're, they're pretty weary at, at this point about you know, people selling stuff, so, yeah, which is not what we're selling. <laughs> How competitive is your revenue sharing as compared to other app stores like Apple's? Uh, it's actually very comparable to Apple's, okay. yes. Um, yeah, uh, it's still something, because, you know, it's, it's an iterative process and, we're, you know, there's still a low number of people that have signed up. We're testing that out. Uh, right now we're pitching 30%, um, so that's, you know, actually right on par with Apple's. Okay, it's and like, that's how you basically took the 30% number? Yes. How do you decide 30%? Okay, right, so from Apple's. We, okay. we, we've talked to a couple other companies um, that, that do platform plays, and at first we actually started with 10%. They said, no, 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 you're going you, to you're gonna leave a lot of money on the table. This pain is much, much greater. So. Okay. People, your people said yes really quickly at the lower number, which made us, we iterated and realized we might be underpriced it. Yeah, we iterated quickly there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but your, uh, your revenue sharing is on top of Apple's, right? Because they're selling it to the Apple's out of the, the store. Right. So is it a total of 60 or what? I don't know. So the way, the way it works is, yeah, it would be a total for 60, a total of 60% that they give away, you know, per app. Um, but it's only for users who use Familia with their app. So say I sell, you know, a game to someone over there and a game to someone over here. This person uses Famigo, we charge, you know, for that app, but not for this app. And then, so it's on incremental sales. Yeah, yeah the, the reason why we charge equivalent to Apple is because we've seen that Famigo users are a lot more likely to share these game purchases with, purchases with each other and invite each other into games. So if the network effect does work well, then uh, that's kind of like free money for the developer. Yeah. <laughs> not, so, so they're willing to, uh, to shell out a little bit for that. It's totally found money. Um, but yeah, as you know, his uh, his question kind 
kind of led us into, which is perfect because I skipped it, is you know, we've identified a bunch of challenges in you know, the, the two sides of markets. And as you can tell from this discussion, I mean, it's, it's a lot of information, it's a lot of work that you know, we've had to really kind of go and, and discover. Um, and you brought up a bunch of points that we haven't even listed. Yeah. But uh, so a couple of them. On the developer side, you know, we mentioned, Cody mentioned that it's a, uh, it's a relatively small market. I mean, there are 200,000 apps on the App Store, but a quarter of them are games. So that gets to be about 50,000. Um, how many of those are indie developers? How many of those are family friendly? How many of those are multiplayer? You know, keep whittling away. Yeah. And so a really you know, gross marketing approach you know, at this stage we feel could be kind of detrimental. They're also, like I said, um, low on cash. A lot of them have really kind of bet the farm on an app because at one point it's a gold rush. And you know, gold rush works for a couple people, but for a lot of people they're just kind of left holding their shovel. Um, and they're also overextended. Um, not only are they overextended in terms of you know mon in terms of you know, the bills that they pay, but they're obviously feeling a lot of social pressure you know from families and family members and uh, everything else. And they're also over approached. They're oversubscribed. I mean, I don't know how many people have apps on the App Store, but you know, we've got three. And I think every week I get some marketer emailing me about we're gonna we're, we're gonna sell your app for you. We're gonna do this. Just sign up with us. Pay us a thousand dollars up front, and oh. you're gonna make ten thousand dollars. Over the, the past two weeks, I got a call uh, from somebody who wanted to set up a meeting with their business development director, and she, she kept calling me, like, don't call me. And it was funny because, I thought it was funny, because she was using the same sales approach as Mikey Trafton was talking, was, was teaching, so um, it, was, it was kind of annoying. So they're definitely oversubscribed, and they're definitely, definitely, um, but uh, I guess, um, I yeah, so this is kind of a negative as well, but they, they love cool tech. Um, I think, you know, one of the key takeaways from this slide is that these are completely different markets and it takes different approaches to discover your customers in each market. Um, for us, initially, one thing that we focused a lot on was this. You know, we would say, look at, look at this static library you just drag into your Xcode project and it does all this magic for you. And uh, they've heard that a lot and it kind of contributes to this problem because this is the tactic that most people take to reach the developers. Right. Um, right. And so we, we had to, to uh, kind of... Uh, change direction on that. <coughs> had to change our message. Um, so on the family side, uh, it, it's really easy to kind of explore um, you know, this market because it is kind of an unlimited market. There's so many people out there that it's unlimited in the sense that we don't have enough money to reach all of them you know, on a significant level at this point. Um, but you know, that also makes it tough because we don't have enough money to reach all of them on a significant point. Uh, <laughs> they're cash rich. Um, so they... Uh, But um, families are underserved. So uh, right now, like our research says, if families want to interact together, and like that image showed, everybody's connected, but nobody's interacting. Um, so if we can get them to interact on this device, which they all say they'd love to do. Kids say that they'd love to play games with their parents, just like they do on the Wii. Um, and parents say the same thing. Um, but again, they're not early adopters either. So uh, this is you know a notable challenge, because any kind of a can't sell a game with a bug to a, you know a normal family member. A kid is just going to eat you up. He's going to spit you <laughs> up. He's going to take it and just delete it. Have you guys any research on how many families have enough iPhones to be able to make this viable? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, and you actually only need the top of your head. you actually only need one. Um, you only need one iPhone to make this viable. Um, it just depends on the game. Okay. There's one game that uh, you know we're talking to that you know you, you use. Uh, the, the game is called Face Race. Everybody should go download it. Um, you take one picture, or I mean, you use one phone that has a camera on it, and you can get as many people to play as you want just by taking a picture. And you get other people to make funny faces with prompts. It's it's a hilarious game. Um, I wrote a blog on it. Q looks like an idiot in the picture that I thought it's, it's <laughs> he hates me for. Uh, um, so, uh, but th that's actually uh, we've discovered we kind of have some expertise there that we can offer to these developers in terms of the different types of multiplayer games you can have based on like device constraints and gaming constraints. And that's one thing that they've responded to really positively, that you know, we're not just like the people Matt talked about shouting, oh, money, money, money. You know, we can actually make your game better from a certain perspective. Um, yeah. Because it's, yeah, it's challenging to do. Sure. So, so how does your brand fit in all this? You mentioned earlier that from the developer's perspective, uh, a user doesn't even necessarily have to know about when you go to enjoy this whole 
experience. So what kind of touch points are you wanting the consumer to have with your brand? Are you emphasizing Amigo or emphasizing just the games? How do you approach that? Um, we do uh, co-branding, and then we're supported by our accounts. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. all the account pages feature Amigo, and once you've set up one of those accounts, <coughs> you can play all the multiplayer apps that are enabled by Amigo functionality. So that encourages people to set up those accounts, and then they can also see other games. And then what are the mechanics of a user becoming notified of a new game on the platform? And I'm assuming that's what fuels this, them inviting other people. What are the mechanics of that? We um, actually just got a compliment on that from Eric. <laughs> Yeah, right now it's, uh, it, we're just sending out emails. We're just sending out notifications. Because when, um, when you sign up, you get an email account. And then um, you know, as we have time, we are going to start doing, once you're in our apps, we'll serve ads for other apps that just on our platform there. And um, we're working on another um, engine that will draw from the other people who are in your neighborhood that are playing the games. And say, you know, the Sullivans are playing this game. You know, someone in your network is doing that, and it's all in the device. And so we're fleshing that out as well. We've got a couple things, but yeah. But yeah, so something that we just so one of the things. Um, so the numbers as far as the devices. Um, what's interesting and why we're on Apple first um, is because the iPod Touch is actually really a huge seller for kids. It's replacing the Nintendo DS as well as the PSP as the gaming platform and device of choice for kids. And it's a way that and we're also seeing some behavior now um, that we've heard from parents a lot where parents are buying their kids that device so they can prolong or like push off the buying of a cell phone so where they take on that whole data plan. And uh, a mom who owns a site here in town called Volunteer Spot just bought her 12 year old daughter, like she was telling me this a couple days ago, um, the iPod touch to push that off. And so that's what makes it attractive. Um, there are, so, but we did hear this a lot about how many families actually have this many smartphone or devices. And so um, we've iterated on that and we've, uh, it will be live soon, something called our neighborhood, which allows family to family pet play. And so then, any one family with one device, as long as you know another family or two with at least one device, all of a sudden you can play a multiplayer game. Yeah. A question. Um, so, do you have anything for games that are free? Or are y'all, because uh, like, you know, the game is just ad based. Right. Do you have anything built for those? Because you can still market and help push people to download those, but there's not the traditional revenue model there of. Yeah. Download, pay. Most of our customer acquisition right now actually comes from a free game that we built okay. uh, called Family Dots. Okay. Everybody, we just push an update. It looks really good, <laughs> um, and that's been really effective in terms of uh, you know getting those eyeballs and then being able to spread the you know the gospel of Famigo to them a little bit and for them to find these other games. But we don't have a revenue model for uh, monetizing free games yet. Um, yeah, that's it, something that we'll have to explore. We. Uh, under the general notion that families don't like ads, they don't like being force fed. So uh, that's going to be a little bit tricky. Um, in the long run, we can't say that like this is one that we really, really want to get to is a, a subscription based all you can eat model where family pays up front, certain like Netflix, 15 bucks a month, and gets all the games they can have. Um, you know, every time we ask about that, they say yes, that'd be great. Well, I mean, the other thing you could do is possibly have like channels of different types of games. Okay, but one of the key takeaways on, on uh, this slide is that these are two vastly different markets, so the customer discovery conversations that we had were completely different. Here, we could walk into a room and say, hey, do you want to play a game with your family? And everybody would be like, yeah, sure, whatever. And uh, here, we walk into a room and say, hey, are you a, uh, uh, an iOS developer with a multiplayer family-friendly game? And uh, you know, we never heard a yes to that. Uh, so it, it required a lot more work to go find these people than it did to go find these people. And like we said before, you know, our whole business hinges on being able to find these people first. For sure. Uh, done. And yeah, I mean, we have 
you kind of talk about. Am I thinking this or are you thinking this? I don't know. Okay. I'll just kick it off. And you can okay, it. sounds good. Pass the baton. <laughs> um, so based on all those challenges, and we have been talking about the solutions kind of intertwined, but we can kind of go over them. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's really, you know, a lot of lean startup, you know, stuff. Everything you read, everything you hear is, you know, get out of the damn office. You know, your customers aren't in there. Uh, <laughs> your customers are somewhere else. Um, our families are at the mall, or they're at a restaurant, or at a coffee shop. Our developers are likely um, in, well, a dungeon. in a dungeon <laughs> or in California. I don't know. Um, <laughs> listen more, sell less. And so this is kind of what, you know, I was talking to uh, what, what I said about Josh is um, we actually had to go find a capital factory mentor to help us work on our sales pitch. And a lot of it involved listening more. Um, in fact, like our sales pitch, you know, if we talk to somebody, is basically, hi, Ash, my name's Matt. Hi. <laughs> hi. Uh, so I feel kind of awkward because I, I, I don't think you know who I am. Um, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's good. Um, then maybe I could take 30 seconds and you know explain what I'm all about, and after that you could kind of tell me if you want to keep talking or not. Sure. Okay, so there's a lot of listing in there. In fact, when we have these conversations, it's more white space than anything else. Um, that was really hard for me to do actually. So, uh, um, point number three is uh, focus on the primary pain, which. We had wrong for the developers. We thought it was going to be tech. We thought, hey, grab our push notifications. We have a piece for free. Hey, um, we've got these great account systems. We have in-game chat. You know, we have. Uh, you can build asynchronous games, which when we offered that, um, I don't think anybody else was at the time. But no, they didn't really care. What they cared about, which we found out, was the fact that we curate those games. If you sign up with Flamigo, we limit the noise. I mean, everybody on Flamigo, all the games on Flamigos are going to be on Flamigo will be quality games, and there's some algorithm that we have to figure out, which is involves the number of games that we have and the number of ears or eyeballs that we have, and we can't go over that number, otherwise we're going to start losing these. Uh, that's already happening on, on other platforms that are out there right now. Um, and the other thing, as I said, is that you know we measure everything. Um, we've got our little dog out there just keeping one eye open, and <laughs> he's recording uh, everything, and so if you guys don't know about pirate metrics, I uh, highly recommend checking out Dave McClure's talks. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, multiple customer sets, it's really helpful to define different metrics for each customer set. Um, so for us, you know, we have numbers for uh, family acquisition as well as developer acquisition. Uh, in terms of activation, an activated family is a lot different from an activated developer. You know, an activated family has gone through the whole gameplay, an activated developer has, you know, made an API call at some point. Um, so those are different numbers and there. It's, it's worth breaking these down one by one um, according to which uh, set of customers you're dealing with. Otherwise you get an inaccurate and kind of like a half idea of what you're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, do you also do our game sort of anal analytics or? Yeah, a little bit. Um, it's real simple right now. It just shows API keys per, or sorry, API calls per game. So we, we get a rough uh, estimate of who's done what based on the games we have in the system. Uh, but it's one thing we need to work on. I'll have those slides. Okay. Um, so if any of you guys have ever talked to us for a while, we've probably started babbling about continuous deployment as we're big fans of that lean side of the spectrum. Um, one of our uh, major offerings is this API that anybody can call to no matter what device they're on. It's just HTTP and JSON. And so, uh, you know, we can deploy the hell out of that thing, you know, like 50 times a day, that's no problem. And we can do the same thing with our web app that all our families sign into and see their points and invite people to because we control both those environments. However, the, the end product that our families are buying, we have very little control over that uh, because it all goes through the app store. And um, that really, really limits the, uh, the speed of iteration. If you find a one letter typo that you wish to correct, you've got to go through the entire process of an app update. And that can be you know, seven days or more. And during that time, maybe you found three more typos, or just like minor changes. And it feels like it never really stops. You're like uh, Sisyphus rolling around. So, so maybe this is uh, just a, a unique data point for you, but uh, I happen to have a, you know, three kids at home. They have iPod Touch, and mm -hmm. uh, one of them has an iPhone. And uh, I can tell you that I don't update their phone more than once a month. So right. it doesn't matter that you would iterate um, 
you know, every other day, it, you know, for them it would be completely <coughs> irrelevant. Right. Uh, maybe, I, I mean, sometimes I don't get around to updating them <laughs> once every other month, you know, so yeah. uh, I think you have to keep that in mind. And I don't think I would be unique. I think that their friends, parents do the same thing with them is that, you know, yeah, finally you've got it, get off my back, you know, go play. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's so, a very good point. Uh, so keep that in mind. I think that you need to work that into your equation. That well, uh, it doesn't matter how agile you are, your customer is not going to be. No, you're exactly right. That makes the problem even more. Yeah, it, 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 it enhances the problem. I mean, if you want to talk about you know any kind of mistake, if we have one mistake in our game, and we sold it. You know, in a game that was developed by somebody else, and we sold it to your kids. They would get it and they'd look at it and they see it was broken and they wouldn't touch it. Yeah. I can tell you that absolutely, that's absolutely true. Right. Um, when they were littler, they would tell me that their computer is broken if a game doesn't work. <laughs> and they wanted a new computer. Yeah. <laughs> wow. so, uh, so you definitely lose them. On the first defect, right. off you go. Right. Um, so we've been experimenting with ways to uh, get around this limitation in the App Store. Um, we've built up some functionality that we can um, pull uh, static content down onto all of our games at every time they start up. So in the event we want to change some verbiage, uh, or we want to change gameplay itself, we've got a game that just came out called Rad Ribs, which is just like Mad Libs, but don't tell the Mad Libs people that. Um, you know, the whole thing is like a, a story-based game. Uh, if we find out that I'm an idiot and I said adjective instead of adverb, it's very easy for us to go in and change the text of those stories without having to do a whole update process. But this is not something that we had any idea we would have to do. We, we imagined this would be much simpler for trivial updates, and it was not the case at all. And thus, we've adopted the, uh, the famous <laughs> credo from the, the epic motion picture hackers, mess with the best, die like the rest. Yeah, no mistakes. <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess our horror story there, just, you know, um, is it we had eight characters? Yeah, we, we, we call them Apple you know, something that we weren't allowed to call in a, in a, in a game, and it was, we changed eight characters, and we had to resubmit it. And it was like two weeks worth of work <laughs> for that whole thing. Yeah. And it was one of their methods that they had deprecated. It, it was just awful. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah. So it seems like uh, like you put a lot of effort into this functionality. This, I guess this came from your own needs, or did this also come from like going to your customer and saying, like, you know, would this feature be useful to you or not? And like, did it come from like your own ideas and stuff? Or? Yes. So that's why we developed those three games first. Um, we developed our own games because yeah. we are our own best customers. We learned the process. You know, we learned all the hard steps, and we figured out what we needed for those games, and what took us a long time, so we can offer this. One nice thing about that is that we, by doing that, we didn't have to guess at a feature set for our minimum viable product because we could kind of serve as the proxy for those customers. And we could wait until we actually needed that feature ourselves to finish this game to implement it. And that's why, why this came in extremely handy, handy for us, but it's not at all something we saw at the very beginning of the, the, uh, the business. Right. right. Um. Um, okay, so kind of uh, customer discovery lessons learned. One thing we found is that we neglected having some of these conversations with developers for too long. We we really thought, having built this platform for these games that we built ourselves, it's really fully featured, but we were kind of coming at everything from a technical mindset at that point. So we would come to them and we would say, hey, push notifications, asynchronous gameplay, all this stuff. And you know, we showed earlier with the market challenges that developers are overextended, and that just kind of uh, fed into that problem because they hear people spouting this technical jibber-jabber all the time. Um, and it, once we really had to get out of the office and uh, find a lot of developers who were sort of in that sweet spot of family style gaming and talk to them. You know, I said earlier there are some developers who have spent thousands of dollars on an app and sold a hundred dollars worth. We had no idea that was like an actual number that you could come across in this business. That just sounds awful, like a bloodbath. And uh, we've talked to a couple of people in that situation. Yeah. Which, yeah, which makes me curious because uh, there's an article a while back about that kind of run some numbers about reported profits and downloads of most popular games. It came up with that half of all developers will earn less than $682 per year on yeah. app sales. <laughs> so it just kind of exemplifies what, what, what you found. So how, how are you changing the game for developers? 
Um, we're changing it through this social means of sharing games with your family and uh, your neighborhood. Okay. Like, so like it's not a distribution problem; it's a marketing problem. Right? It's developers know how to code; okay. they don't know how to sell. Okay. And so we're offering them selling. This your your system is built on top of the app the Apple App Store, right? No. It's a totally separate platform. Totally separate. Well, well, in, in yes. reality, you kind of have an alternative App Store, even though you're not going around the App Store because you have right. the App Store of Amigo itself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right. so but it, it it what what it is is it's a a library that you would drag into an existing app that's sold through the App Store. Right. So you know we're not trying to. Take anything from Apple. Right, and that's not even my question. I think what I was going back to was as a developer, what you were saying is, you know, that's a big selling point, being able to iterate, right? Mm -hmm. um, but how what, does that work if you're on top of the Apple Store and it well, still has to go through the same two week approval program? Well, all of our, our games uh, rely on network connectivity for everything that we do. Uh, so the first time you fire your game up, it, it logs into Amigo and verifies, like, okay, which family member am I based on my device ID? And that's when we pull all that content down. So, uh, you know, th that still goes through the app approval process, but once it's in, we can still tweak things a little bit ourselves in the back end because we can rely on that connectivity to suck all that new data information down. Okay, so the application that the developer has written itself, so, so are you saying like every single, so a cer certain subset of changes right. are able to be deployed as quickly as you're talking about, and yeah. then some might not. Yeah, yeah, oh, right. So okay. if it's like static content, and you know, simple gameplay stuff does work. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so I think I kind of covered this stuff. Uh, oh, but the last point is kind of interesting. Um, you know, a lot of people try to quantify this if you're dealing with multiple customer sets. Is it twice as hard? Is it like four times as hard? Um, I don't think we really found it um, twice as hard because of the fact that uh, it's so easy to find people who want to play these family games. Um, and they, they're so underserved that what they were looking for was a very bare minimum of interaction with the other people in their family. Like, you know, tic-tac-toe, that's about the easiest thing you can imagine a family playing. And families are all over us bringing a tic-tac-toe game out. Uh, so in terms of the difficulty of building that, that's not that hard. Um, and also, us being our own customer really helped us in the sense of building up on the developer side uh, because we didn't have to uh, do a whole lot of iteration to get that minimal, minimally viable <coughs> product out the door. Right. Yeah, and so as you can tell, we've, uh, <laughs> we've been talking this over a lot, so sometimes we race ahead of the slides. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, fake until you make it, I don't think it's a bad strategy at all. That worked really well for us. The nice thing about it is that we were able to test those core assumptions very quickly. Um, the assumptions that we had at the very beginning about um, families wanting to play together, developers being interested in tapping into this market, uh, and existing technology not fit, not suiting that uh, those needs. Without us making those initial games ourselves, it would have been really hard to attract that first developer and uh, you know build up enough belief in these weird dudes who don't have any games uh, to actually get something to market. So um, it, it reduced a lot of risk in that regard because we had stuff that was already in the market by the time we were ready to have these serious conversations with developers. Yeah? How did, how did you avoid the temptation to like make it cooler than you really need to do it? Because when you're your first customer, you know, you're kind of like kind of cheating a little bit about like you know, the whole like customer development going out and you know figuring yeah. out like what people are willing to pay for. It helps a lot that we're not very cool guys. <laughs> uh, I, I also got hungry. You know, it's uh, you, you got to sell stuff in order to get you know money mm -hmm. pay for food. So okay. yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, kind of a constant trumpet for us is to get something out the door. Um, so while we were our first customers, if you go look at the games we have, they're kind of neat. But you know, I don't think anybody would say they're just jam packed with. Uh, with features. Right. Um, and so, uh, in terms of going after these multiple customer sets, we found it very easy to, uh, to have a pull strategy for families. Once they knew what we were up to, they would come to us and say, do you have more games yet? Do you have more games yet? Uh, whereas developers, 
were not coming up to us and saying, do you have more features yet? But we had to go to them. And um, from a, an implementation perspective, it really helped for us to focus on just one customer set at a time. Because it's kind of a, a context switch. If you go from, okay, I'm building something great for a, for a developer, to, oh, I'm building something great for a family. You, know, you, you have to get into a different mindset for each one of those. So uh, for me, I would have like a few day long iteration on one side and then a few day long iteration on another side and just kind of bounce back and forth like that, um, deciding what to do based upon feedback from uh, the people that we had already spoken with. Yeah. And so this is, uh, if we had to pick five things out of the multitude of things that we've been talking about going forward, this is, you know, these are the five things that we're, you know, we're really trying to focus on. Is, you know, like I said, push strategy for developers, pull for families, focus on customer product development one side at a time, which, you know, uh, keeps a, you know, it's a nice cycle. It's a lot of work, right? Effort's always up here, but um, alternate development and testing, and then, you know, really, really try to, you know, use hacks, like Cody was talking about, to minimize the batch size. Can you talk a little bit about how you actually did customer discovery with the families? Or did you interview groups? Did you, yeah. What did you do there? Yeah, um, yeah lots of interviews. Um, lots of, uh, we'd send out surveys. We got a lot of, you know, statistically relevant data from that. Um, and then I got a bunch of kind of, like, pre-packaged um, uh, studies that are done on behalf of, like, big media companies. Um, I'm from traditional media, and so I still have connections there. And so I was able to mine for data and get a bunch um, on that. And then lots of it is, uh, you know, we've tested extensively. Once we thought we had minimal viable products, we went out and set up testing sessions with a bunch of families and just worked with them a lot um, on multiple occasions and uh, saw what it really looks like working and we continue to do that. And I think early on you kind of mentioned that families are not <coughs> so much early adopters and so the full strategy only works if you've seen it enough families to where they make that viral. So how do you? Full strategy works if we have enough games is what we found out. Um, okay. Every family that we tell says, man, this is great. You know, they say that they love the account structure, they love being able to have, you know, this quote that we have that, you know, I love the fact that my family, you know, my whole family is at one, in one place online. Um, they love the idea of being able to, you know, interact with their neighbors, you know, online and play games with their neighbors. But everybody says, go on more games, go on more games, so. In terms of the late adopter thing, this technology isn't new. Um, you know, kids have had iPod touches for a while, adults have had smartphones for a while. Had we been trying to do something like this three or four years ago, it probably would have been a lot harder for families to wrap their minds around. But you know, adults play words with friends, and that's very similar to the, the style of gameplay that we have. This is just, you know, everything with family, sort of. Sure. Sorry for asking so many questions. Okay, so uh, before you mentioned a, um, Developer side hypothesis that you had that you validated through testing and stuff. Can you give? Can you share any specifics about what kind of hypotheses you had on the family side and what you did to test that, or what kind of questions you asked? Like, for example, did you did you think on the family side, like you know, they really like action games, and then you ended up they didn't, or or were your all your initial assumptions correct from the start? Or, I mean, yeah, it, uh, well, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, what? Uh, so the family assumptions, we actually, uh, we didn't start developing until we'd spent a lot of time with families. Um, and so the story there goes is that, you, I mean, I know how many of you know how long we've been around, but we started with Capital Factory uh, in summer of 09. And uh, so I mean, while we did do some developing then, it was, it was all, none of it was released, it was all testing. And so we had a lot of time to really um, just kind of go out and talk to families and ask them what they wanted while, you know, while we started development um, during that whole summer and, and during the fall. So we had the luxury of not really needing to go into it with hypotheses, I guess is what I'm trying to say, is we just kind of went out and asked what they wanted. Well, I was kind of curious on, like, did you try the, the, the sales approach that you just demonstrated? You just walk up oh. to random families and say, hi? Oh, no, no. It's friends of friends, connections. Okay. You know, we utilized our own family networks to, uh, to get introductions to people. Uh, introductions from them to other people to start getting some distance between us because it's you know any any direct connection you know the inter 
interaction and everything is going to be um, corrupted just because you have that pre-existing relationship. And so we started to get kind of hear different stuff the further away we got. And um, you know, we were lucky enough that people were very nice and people were very interested in this and think it's a cool idea that families almost every time um, we were walking out of a testing session would be like, hey, you know, I know some other people or my neighbors would be really into this if you need more testing families. And so, um, you know, it's kind of anecdotal, but that also, you know, was, you know, finding the families to test with, we've never had an issue with that. objections one thing that helped us a lot was to put as much as possible out onto github so if you're looking at github right now you'd find our iphone and ipad sdk you'd also find a working exam example app so that kind of removes a lot of the uh, you know magical pixie dust elements of what we're describing because you can just load all this up in xcode and start hacking it up yourself and you can see that it's not very much code to actually integrate all of our stuff i did the example app in like a few hours um, so i mean having actual functioning code i think helps quite a bit there it's also not a new concept to developers. There have been a couple platforms that have been out, and I mean that, that's actually really helped us. Uh, it, it reduced a lot of uh, the questions on how do we deliver this, you know, to developers. But if, you know, Open Faint and Plus Plus and uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Crystal SDK, they've all got you know APIs um, and SDKs that you can use. And so developers have been you know using these for a year or so. Speaking of uh, Open Faint, how do you plan on? Your differentiation basically we are just your family yep um, I like to uh, use the metaphor that you know you watch TV open fate would be like uh, ABC NBC Fox they've got all kinds of programming um, we're the Disney Channel and Nickelodeon we're family channel all families all the time but family also by making them multiplayer um, which is a radically different and more social um, experience than just simply putting something up on a leaderboard. And um, we've actually really watched them very closely and tried to learn a lot from Open Vein. Um, so people who are integrating with us now have had apps on Open Vein. And um, you know, we've learned some lessons there. And one is that they felt like it was a new level of noise just built on top of their apps. And then all of a sudden, you know, Open Vein has, I think, you know, four or 5,000 apps they're all also really varying qualities, you know, all next to each other. And the functionality is really just kind of leaderboards. <coughs> and they might do, you know, a free app, you know, once a day or something, which which is just like, you know, on a smaller scale, Apple saying, oh, this is a featured app. For that one person who's anointed, thus gets, you know, this big spike. And then, you know, it's back to business as usual. And then if you can, you know, kiss the ring and get that. Um, but we found it like actually a slower process because our families are, or because our customers are, you know, slower adopters, and they want, you know, and we've learned from them too, you know, kind of a more steady quality um, pipeline of content as opposed to just this, you know, additional noise. Because we've also discovered that that app, uh, the the level of noise is something that actually both customers have in common. 
which is really interesting. And so, you know, sometimes there's that commonality when you are doing this, where you can find those little touchstones, where you can do something to serve both of them. And in our case, it's to turn down the noise. Anyone who's been to the app store, which I assume is everyone in this room at least, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to find something that you want. And even, you know, if it's a recommended one, you know, it's a, uh, you don't know, and there's not really a good engine to discover that stuff. You know, it's the same thing for developers to be discovered. And so we're actually taking a different approach by really listening and learning um, from what some of these other platforms are doing. So how are you going to res resolve that problem once you have thousands of little, you know, games in your in your platform? So as I said, <coughs> I mentioned earlier that uh, we believe there's an algorithm that has apps on one, number of apps on one side, number of families on the other. I mean, there's some balance. So you're going to control that, that. That that's that that's actually our main selling point um, okay. for developers right now. Is that we're going to limit the number of apps, you know, to the number of consumers. I mean, if we can monitor the sharing, you know, that goes on between them, and we can monitor downloads and everything like that. If it's not it's not optimized for you know pretty much everybody. Then you know we've got too many apps. Uh, how would you decide which apps make it and which ones not? Well, right now it's a little bit different. Or games, you know, no, not yeah. apps, but the web games. I guess. Yeah, I mean, right now you know we have some really basic things like you know, of course, make sure the content is family appropriate, right. you know, of a certain quality level, and you know we, we you know as we get better, we'd like to raise the bar and all that stuff. And um, you know we're finding that like something like once a week right now is a pretty decent um, you know release and like an achievable goal on our side from a business development perspective. Um, again, we're you know we like to really embrace lots of this you know the lean startup methodology. And so as that pipeline gets full, you know well, what does what does two games a week look like, or you know a game on Wednesday and a game on Friday or whatever that is. And we'll constantly be testing that. And you know, we'll test that from week to week. We'll try, what about two on Saturday morning? Even when we release our different um, the email cam campaigns right now, we test it at different times and different days and see what kind of feedback that is. When people are sitting in front of their computers, when they're thinking about this. Like, um, we saw a big spike um, two weeks ago by releasing something on Saturday morning. You know, when families are around, come together. And so, you know, we're learning from that too. And, uh, you know, um, it's something that um, we don't think will ever be done. But, you know, what we do know is that too much noise right now is a big problem. And so anything we can, you know, if we hold back a little bit right now, we think that might be a better strategy than contributing more to the noise. I can see kind of a nightmare scenario uh, as a developer where you know, I go off and I get your SDK and I spend the next year developing my cool game you know, and then I'm ready to go and you say well it's not family oriented enough or you've got this backlog of games you know trying to release them one per week and you're going to get my game up in the next you know eight months. Yeah. Now you've got the, the app store problem but multiplied you know much bigger. That would be a good problem. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's good for you. Yeah. Yeah. There's demand for the platform. Yeah. So but how it's, much it's bad for me you know, <laughs> as a developer. So. Yeah, right now we're not working with anyone actually building new apps specifically for Famigo, really. Uh, we're taking existing games. Well, yeah, but these are people, people we kind of specifically targeted. But you know, most of the, the customers we're trying to find right now have existing games that fit that rubric that Matt was talking about, or Matt or Q was talking about, and uh, getting them integrated in a day or two so we don't have to worry about a backlog. And right now the rubric is easy. It's fun, family, and interactive. Yeah. And so if you get those three things, then uh, yeah, you're pretty much going with us right now. <laughs> and, then, and then because you know, because we're at this stage and we, you can repurpose your existing apps you know, that have already run through their life cycle, and with the um, you know day or so, maybe two days it takes to integrate, um, we haven't run up against that problem yet. Um, and that's that's a, a challenge that you know hopefully we get to face at some point. Yeah. Uh, I think so. Are you next? Or I don't know. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm curious to know how continuous deployment is working with an API and developers, considering that if you change something that breaks their code or whatnot, how can you iterate quickly with your SDK? Uh, well, we don't introduce breaking changes via continuous deployment. Um, if we do introduce something that's a breaking change, 
you know, we'll make sure to deprecate that method really far in advance and then go back through the logs over the past four weeks and verify that no one has called it. Like I just did one of those changes today and the amount of work we did getting to that point was pretty substantial. So typically the stuff we continues to continues to deploy are uh, new methods to the API. So, you know, new methods not gonna break a contract for anybody. So, so that's how we handle that. That's a good point. That was uh, one of the, um, one of the criticisms people have of the other app, or I mean, of the other platforms, um, and uh, I don't want to bash names, but yeah, they said that you know they're sick of you know having a new release of an API or an SDK every other week. And their users want that, you know, they want the new, you know, open thing, or they want the new plus plus or something like that. And they just, you know, that's a lot of support. So, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He was next. No. <laughs> of course. Um, <laughs> are there any other platforms? That partners to try and integrate with and what is yeah. that? Yeah, well, for sure. Um, Game Night Games, uh, we just announced a partnership with, uh, actually they changed it to Game Salad. And so these are partnerships that fit in with uh, like a development pipeline. Um, so if I'm a developer and I'm starting to develop an app, you know, I'm going to look at shortcuts or I'm going to look at platforms to help me develop that. So Game Salad uh, helps non-programmers uh, build games for I publish to iPhone. Um, and so you create the artwork, uh, and they have a, uh, a very easy you know, user interface. And so as an option to some of their more you know, promising games, they offer Famigo integration um, in order to help them make those games multiplayer. Um, that's one example. There are a couple other tools that you know, we'd like to start looking at. One is uh, called Corona. Um, it's kind of a similar you know, iPhone, or actually cross-mobile um, OS development platform. Uh, there's Unity, um, things like that. Things, you know, those, those kinds of platforms that will that make sense in a, in a development platform. But are you also talking about other, like Android? No, I'm talking about are. other platforms. I was also asking about other platforms that already have games, you know, network of 50 developers and 50 games or whatever. Maybe some kind of web share or something like that. Yeah. People are talking about Android. Yeah, yeah that's my <laughs> question actually. Um, uh, I guess two questions. One. Is there um, a similar platform that have sort of multiplayer for you know, some full-time and the multiplayer for people's kind of now besides you guys? Or, uh, right. Yeah, that's Open Faint and uh, Plus Plus. They're kind of you know like so Plus Plus. Well. Yeah, Plus Plus. So. But they're um, they're more of a publisher. They offer the same thing, but I think getting at they're not open, so getting access is more difficult. There's Crystal SDK, which is Pretty, it's, it's another closer publishing platform. There's another list. There's Cloud Cell. There are a couple others. Um, yeah. And then the other question was um, Android. Are you guys, I mean, is there a timeline for that or anything about next year? We don't have a timeline right now. Um, iPhone is such a huge market. Um, we're waiting uh, for you know, Winmo, which is not Winmo, but Win7 though. And, uh, and Android because of, uh, as we said, kids are the driver of play, and kids have iPods. And there isn't a similar device running Android OS or running uh, Win7 right now. So when that happens, yeah, we and well, Android's supposed to have one you know, for Christmas, basically. Mm -hmm. if it, if it takes. There are a couple that uh, Samsung has one, and Arcos has one now. But I think it's all okay. Kids, kids have it. Yeah. That kind of fits in with what we, you know, when we're talking about in the customer discovery, and sometimes us, um, you know, when we first approached it, selling the wrong thing, and uh, you know, we we're like, yeah, we're going to be, you know, device agnostic, and you know, we'll have an SDK for Android, and you know, we'll have all this cool tech. And this is what we're going to sell because we thought, oh, you know, these other people are working on it. You know, we need that to be competitive. No one's really on the customer side asked for that yet. No one's paying for Android games. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and so no, you know, so no one's asking for it. And so you know, but if we can take that one, you know, the SDK that we have for Apple, which we know people are willing to pay for and are really interested in and spend that time instead making that better and working on that. That seems like a better use of our, of course, very limited bandwidth. And, uh, you know, we'll 
would we kind of all secretly like to go to Android at some point and do that cross-platform thing oh, and see gosh. some of this migrate away from Apple? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, yes. And uh, you know, are, are, are we positioned if that happens down the line to you know buckle down and uh, build out that SDK for Android? Like, absolutely, but uh, not until we're asked and paid to do it. So maybe one point that you know we've, we've kind of said a bunch, but maybe we didn't write down was uh, I mean we're watching our competitors very closely, and OpenFaint just released a uh, Android SDK. <laughs> You know, you can watch that. I'm, you know, one of my favorite games is uh, by a developer called uh, Mr. Fung Fung, and it's, uh, <laughs> it's it's cool. Such it's, a cool name. Yeah, it's called Mini Squadron. You you've got a little you know plane and you're shooting around and you can shoot tons of stuff. It's awesome. Um, but now you can have real time play over Wi-Fi between an iPhone and an Android phone. And yippee doo dah. But you listen to his Twitter feed and he's like, okay, I'm, I'm up here on a, an iPhone. But I'm I'm not doing you know I had a I had a peak on Android and now I'm doing okay you know it's it's not really like the the gold line that, that you thought it was going to be one because they're not paying for apps they're hacking apps you know with our kids stuff like that so we get to watch which is one of the really big you know things that we've got teachers you know, so. yeah we kind of get to uh, use them as a laboratory where they establish all these hypotheses like okay pe people are going to love this feature people are going to love this feature and all this crazy <coughs> platform stuff. And we can see if customers actually do use that. Um, but we don't jump off the cliff ourselves and do all this work. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting. Families just, by design, are a little <coughs> bit slower moving. You have to you know, mobilize that many people and get them all the technology. So they're not as, you know, they're not the bleeding edge of that technology. And so, you know, yeah. lots of the time we try to work towards that bleeding edge and see what kind of trickles down. And so we have a little bit of a, a buffer in our development yeah, for that. Absolutely, that helps. I sure. Thought, uh, this is probably not related, but how big is your team? How many you guys have been so with the development right now? We're know. huge, man. We're, this is all us. This building is all us. This is uh, the Amigo Tower. Have you not heard that? <laughs> no, we're, we're at three and a half right now. So, uh, so that's one thing that makes it kind of difficult, you know, trying to please two sets of customers. There are three, three and a half of us. We've got to deal with Apple, uh, but you know that's why we're constantly developers. trying to find hacks to you know minimize these iterations. One and a half developers. One and a half. Okay. Yeah, actually maybe one and a quarter because I can, I, I can change a little bit of HTML. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's busy. <laughs> we are busy. Yeah. How do you guys fund it? Oh, wow. <coughs> Bootstrap. Bootstrap. Uh, what ratio do you have? I actually haven't looked that up. Yeah, that's a good question. We should be capturing that. We are. I got it. That's, that. that's a good idea, though. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Are we all out of questions? Awesome. Well, thank you for listening to us. Thank you. Thanks for